Hey folks, it's time for another Star Trek video, and this will not be one of those regulation Trek Actually videos where I try my best to produce the highest quality video I can. No, no, it's the opposite of that. It's a not actually Trek Actually, where I put forward the absolute minimum amount of effort required to make a video that is arguably kind of watchable. And for this video, I am really phoning it in because you have already done most of the work for me because I will be responding throughout this video to comments that you fine viewers of mine have left on past Trek Actually videos. So thank you so much for doing most of the work for me in order to produce this video, which I will profit handsomely from and you will see not a single penny in exchange for your effort. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. Let's get to the first comment, huh? These first several comments are from my most recent Trek Actually video about how come Seven of Nine is actually more than just eye candy. This first one is from Mark Malabranch, who says, when you think about it, it makes total sense that Janeway was promoted after Voyager made it back to the Alpha Quadrant. She has all the makings of a crazy admiral, which I suppose we saw play out in the series finale. That series finale of Voyager was some classic Star Trek crazy admiral behavior from Janeway, was it not? And yeah, it makes total sense if we take Janeway as, as, an, uh, as growing into that crazy admiral archetype. But uh, I also kind of always assumed that the reason Janeway got promoted, as, as we see in uh, Star Trek Nemesis, where she is now an admiral and she's giving the orders of the movie to Captain Picard, I always kind of thought that was a way of uh, Starfleet dealing with the Janeway situation in the only way it could, because they couldn't just fire Janeway or court-martial her or punish her because she was a hero. She had led her crew back safely from the other side of the galaxy. So, you know, they couldn't just, they, they, they couldn't put her in prison because she was a hero. But at the same time, they definitely couldn't just leave her in charge of a starship. Oh my God. So they did the best thing they could, and they promote. They they pushed her upwards. They kicked her upstairs, and they said, "You won't be, you, you won't be commanding any more starships, Admiral Janeway. We're going to put you right up here in the middle of the command structure, where you'll have some authority, but you know we'll we'll have you close by so we can keep an eye on you." Huh? So yeah, I think either one of those are are uh, adequate explanations for how come Janeway got promoted so quickly when uh, Voyager got back home. This next one is from Nathaniel Robinson, the only one who stands up for the doctor. Somewhere Tuvix weeps. Great video, Steve. I have no issue with actor or character, but there is something strange about how the writers and producers approached the character. They created a cliched character, the sexy girl who doesn't understand her sexuality but whom men prey upon, and patted themselves on the back because of it. Seven of Nine was effectively Weedkin's Lulu, the character whom Louise Brooks would become identified with in Pandora's Box. Then they focused most of their energy on that character. The character of Seven was able to develop, but they would not allow the same attention to focus on other characters. Indeed, Ron Moore's two episodes for Voyager were a Klingon episode, of course, and a Seven episode, again, of course. Kudos to Jerry Ryan. I don't know if the writing staff deserves the same praise. Overall, for the, the duration of the series, I would say the writing on Voyager was typically very poor. But... I'm not entirely comfortable saying that that was, in, that was all the fault of the writers because uh, the, the producers in charge of Voyager, uh, Rick Berman and Brandon Braga, were not always the best people to turn to for creative advice. And, and as we know, they, they had some, uh, s some problematic ideas about uh, the portrayal of women on the show and uh, the uh, portrayal of, of uh, gay characters and, and diversity in general and their, their concept for Voyager as being a, an intentionally static show where things didn't change very much from episode to episode on purpose because they had this idea that, well, if we do too many long story arcs and there's too much character development and, and the characters become too different than how they were in the pilot, well, then people won't watch the show. Everybody will get lost. We want people to be able to jump on 
this series at any time and it doesn't and it, we're we're making this for syndication eventually and it won't so it won't matter what order they watch the episodes in and that, they, that was very strongly a mentality with with you know how they approach Voyager and that really hamstrung the writers so I don't want to let the writers totally off the hook for what a crappy show Voyager was most of the time because obviously they wrote it they deserve a lot of the blame for it but it wasn't entirely their fault and they were working within some very very heavy uh, constraints imposed on them by the producers of that show and I think you can apply that to the character of Seven of Nine as well do I wish that the writers had given the same amount of attention to other characters on the show that they showed to Seven of Nine and to a lesser extent to the Doctor? Yes, absolutely. I think they should have shown the same amount of attention or at least a greater amount of attention to other characters on the show as they did to Seven and to a lesser extent to the Doctor. So I can blame the writers for that. But, but the concept of Seven as the sexy character who doesn't understand her sexuality that I don't think we can entirely blame the writers for. And I can give the writers credit for seeing to it that she grew beyond that and she became more than just that superficial, cynical trope. So for that, I give the writers credit. And I don't place as much blame on them for the reasons that Voyager failed and for the shortcomings of Seven's character as originally conceived. Um, as, as you maybe think I should. I, I, would, I would blame the producers for that. And I would blame the writers to a certain extent, but I wouldn't blame the writers completely. And I wouldn't say that the writers don't deserve to be uh, congratulated for the good work that they did manage to get done on that show. Next question is from G.N. Shapiro. Wait, regarding next month's video theme, do you have evidence that conservative people do in fact enjoy Star Trek in significant numbers? Well, I don't know about significant numbers. I've never seen a, a proper survey or a proper uh, poll that gives a reliable figure. I've just had anecdotal evidence. So I, I don't know how significant the numbers of conservative people are in the fan base, but I know that it is certainly nothing unusual. Um, the, the subject of next month's proper Trek Actually video, uh, for those of you who don't know yet, will be uh, what, why do conservatives actually enjoy Star Trek? And yeah, I can't say that, I can't say I know how large a segment of the fan base uh, are people who could be described as politically conservative. But I know that it's it's not at all unusual. I know I get comments on my videos all the time from people who claim to be conservatives and like Star Trek and for whatever reason like my videos, even though I never miss an opportunity to tell them to fuck off and to blame them for all of the problems that Star Trek is commenting upon and telling us we need to fix. Um, but uh, yeah, yes, I, I don't know how large of a segment they are, but there is certainly nothing unusual in the fan base. It is not, it is, it is commonplace enough that it's, it's, it is not rare in my experience at all to encounter a conservative who is also a big Star Trek fan. Here's one from Jane. She was my first, I don't know if I want to be her or be with her moment. Confusing for a guy, perhaps. Just one of many signs that I managed to deny and repress before accepting that I wasn't a guy. Voyager eventually helped me to come out. Take that, Berman. And thank you, Jane, for sharing that. And, you know, one of the things about Seven of Nine that I am learning as a result of the, uh, the comments on that video that I did and that, that I knew already a little bit because I'd heard people talk about this before, but the, the, uh, the number of comments on my video from people who are talking about how much her character meant to them in a really, really deep personal way. Like you saying that she was, she was one of the starting points that, that, that started you down the path toward coming out and realizing what your actual gender identity was. Or people who are on the autism spectrum who say that they related to her uh, and and they, they saw her as a character who was coded autistic that they could connect with, or people who have social anxiety who collect who connect with her in a, her, her difficulty in socializing with people, or people who have survived trauma of one type or another, and they connect with her on that basis as a trauma survivor who is 
getting on with her life, but still has to deal with the trauma that she lived through. I mean, there's all kinds of really, really deep reasons why people connect with her character. And that really, I'm so glad that people have shared that because it gives me an extra appreciation for that character that I didn't really touch on all that much in my video. I talked about her character arc and how she was written and how they were able to give her a little bit more depth than, than other characters on the show, but I didn't really talk about ways in which fans with vastly different experiences than my own have felt that character reaching out to them and touching them in a very personal way. So that's that's a really, really wonderful thing. And I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that people have felt comfortable sharing that in the comments to that video because it helps me. It gives me more insight into the character and and, and to what she means to people that I wouldn't have gotten because those are not my experiences. Um, I, I don't connect to the character personally in those ways. But now I, I have a great deal of, of uh, testimony from folks like you who uh, have shared that, in fact, like that character means a lot to them on a very personal level. Here's one from Guy Smiley. I propose a 50-year ban on any character in any media to mention the fable of the scorpion and the frog. I will second that right now. That is one of the most over-told stories in fiction that I am aware of, so much so that there is a, there's a joke in last year, in an episode of last year's Steve and Stuffy videos. And for those of you who watch the Star Trek stuff and don't know, I do a series um, called Steve and Stuffy that's me and uh, interacting with a cast of stuffed animals that myself and my wife do the voices for. And it's my favorite thing that I ever do. And I love the Steve and Stuffy videos. Um, and it, it, so I know a lot of you don't watch them. You're just here for the Star Trek stuff. But trust me, I love the Steve and Stuffy videos. They're my favorite thing that I do. And um, there's, a, there's a joke in one of the videos in that series from this past season where I am trying to tell the parable of the scorpion and the frog and everybody has already heard that story and they keep interrupting me and saying, uh, we've heard the story, we know it's the scorpion and the frog and I keep interrupting them back and insisting that I finish it. Uh, I really feel like that has to be the, the human reasonable response when someone tries to tell that story because we've all heard that fucking story, Chakotay. We've all heard that fucking story. You don't need to tell us the parable of the scorpion and the frog or the scorpion and the turtle or whatever your version of it is. We know it's his nature. We got it. Here's one from Mason Wheeler. I'm not sure I agree with your analysis of latent image. How many times has the doctor saved the lives of people on this ship? How many times has he saved the entire ship? Yes. And that is exactly the point. Janeway is acutely aware of how critical the Doctor is to their continued survival. As the captain, she has a duty to her entire crew, and it would be very wrong of her to put all of them in danger by letting a glitching piece of software bring him down, particularly when it's within her power to easily fix it. Heck, it could be argued that it's a much less awful choice than the one Troy faced in Thine Own Self, where sacrificing a crew member, letting him die, to save the rest of the ship was clearly presented as the right thing to do. If so, why is deleting a specific memory that is causing the doctor to malfunction fixing him, rather than either killing him or forcing him to go through further trauma, a bad thing? If anything, Seven's idealistic position comes across as unwittingly sadistic. She means well, but she's forcing pain and trauma upon him that he's not capable of dealing with. And it was still by no means a certain thing that the doctor would ever be able to work through this and recover. And then they'd be without a doctor and everyone would die. As you note later on, talking about prey, an act of compassion that gets everyone killed isn't worth all that much. This episode is one of those really poor Star Trek morality plays that seems really profound at first glance, but the more you look at it, the less and less sense it makes. Yes, Seven was right in Prey, but in Latent Image, she really wasn't. Janeway was clearly correct when you look at the bigger picture. Your interpretation and, and your um, argument for why Janeway is right makes a lot more sense if you assume that the Doctor is not actually a person. If you assume that the Doctor really is just, as you put it, a glitching piece of software then I see where you're coming from. But if you assume that the Doctor is a person, as Seven does, and that the Doctor is entitled to the same rights that a, a, a flesh and blood person is, then I just, I don't see the argument, even, even given the danger to the ship, even given the, the times when a captain may have to 
do something morally questionable or do something very distasteful that they don't actually want to do for the greater good of the ship so that everybody else can survive. Even, even given the allowances that, that I think have to be made for those situations. If the doctor were a human doctor instead of a holographic doctor, and if there were some kind of brain surgery that could be performed on the doctor to take out the part of his brain or erase the memory of his trauma so that he would completely forget that it ever happened and he would then be able to go on with his life as though it had never happened. And the doctor did not consent to that procedure, but the captain forced him to undergo it anyway under the, the logic that, well, he's our only doctor and it's for the good of the ship. He has to be able to do his job at maximum proficiency. So whether he wants it or not, we're going to lobotomize him in this way uh, so that he will get past this trauma. He'll forget all about it and he'll be able to continue being the doctor. I just, if you, if you, tr if you say he's not a hologram anymore, he's a flesh and blood person, but you keep everything else basically the same, that his memories are rewritten without his consent for the convenience of everybody else on the ship. I, I just, I can't see my way to saying that's an okay thing to do. I think the only difference, the only reason why it's even remotely considered okay is because the doctor is a hologram, not a flesh and blood person. Because the doctor is, is a synthetic intelligence rather than a biological intelligence. I just, I don't think, you know, and part, I think part of the point of that episode is that that distinction should not matter when it comes to affording rights to people. You know, the fact that the doctor is a, a computer program rather than a flesh and blood person, that does not mean that the doctor does not deserve to be treated as an individual with, with basic rights that ought to be protected. So, I mean, I, I see where you're coming from, and I think it's a really interesting take on the episode, and it's certainly a take that I never even considered. But in the end, I personally don't find it persuasive. Because I, if the doctor were a flesh and blood person rather than a, a computer program, then I, I don't think most of us would even consider saying that, oh, the captain should be allowed to alter his memory without his knowledge or consent. But it would be okay because he's a computer program. I mean, it only works if you assume the doctor is a person, then I don't see any way that Janeway was in the right there. This one is from Stitch Sander. Why do you need to post this when in fact you do feel that she is an eye candy as you call it? I don't see other YouTubers calling her that. Isn't that term in itself disrespectful and tries to rob Jerry Ryan of her acting credits? Either way, why does it matter? She is brought onto the show and because of her character, she is at odds with most of the crews and has issues with the captain. Well, I don't know if other YouTubers are calling her that or not, but I mean, the universe exists beyond YouTube and the, the, uh, the universe of, of critical analysis <laughs> exists beyond what YouTubers are saying. And I, I, that was a, a knock on Seven of Nine for a long time, that she was the TNA character, that she was the, the eye candy, that she was added to the show to boost the sex appeal. And as I say in the video, and this is, this is, is no disrespect meant to Jerry Ryan whatsoever, um, that was true. That was a reason why that character was added to the show. Like, I don't see, there's not really any argument against that. That is the reason why that character was added, because they thought it would boost ratings and it would, if they sexied up the show by adding a, a gorgeous woman into the cast and had her dress in a skin tight outfit. Now, because of her talent as an actor, and because her character was one of the only characters on the show that wound up being fairly well developed and well written with a, with a character arc and uh, being allowed to grow and change. Um, she transcended that. She became more than that. And that is to the credit of the writers who wrote the character that way. And it is very much to the credit of Jerry Ryan and her talent as an actor. I don't think it diminishes her talent or her work as Seven of Nine in the slightest to acknowledge the truth that she was added to the show to boost the sex appeal. And a lot of people derided her character and derided her presence on the show because of that at the time and since then. But because of her talent and because of the way that character was written, she was able to overcome that. I don't think that's insulting to her. 
to acknowledge that and then to say, but she was so good that she actually managed to get past that. So I certainly didn't mean any disrespect to her in that way. And I don't think the video comes across that way. Maybe you took it that way, but um, I don't think uh, personally, it may, and this is myself critiquing myself. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but I don't think the video comes across that way either. I don't think it comes across as insulting to Jerry Ryan or, um, or demeaning of her contribution to the show or dismissive of her by saying that she was an eye candy character. I, I think it's uh, a celebration of what she was able to accomplish, given the fact that the character was added to the show for such a cynical way. And you know who agrees with me, by the way? Jerry Ryan. That's right, get a good look. Now, these next few comments are from my video that I made as part of the Captain Picard Day collaboration with Jesse Gender and a bunch of other cool uh, Star Trek-themed YouTubers. My video for that series was about the scene between Captain Picard and Scotty on the holographically recreated bridge of the classic Trek Enterprise in the episode Relics. And the first comment from that video is from Muppet Overlord, who says, one of my favorite Picard quotes is one when Data has a crisis of confidence over losing a game. It is possible to make no mistakes and still lose. That is not weakness. That is life. It's one of my favorite Captain Picard quotes too. One of my favorite quotes from any Star Trek show. What a great bit of wisdom that all of us should remember, especially when things don't go our way. You know, it is possible to make no mistakes and still lose. It doesn't mean you fucked up. It just means that the other person was better or the breaks didn't go your way. That it, it doesn't, you know, there's not necessarily anything you could do differently to change it. And you should accept that. You know, that's that's a very difficult bit of wisdom for us to accept, but I think it's very, very important for us all to realize that sometimes that's how it happens. And a very important lesson for Data to learn, and a very important lesson for all of us to learn too. So yeah, I agree. Great Captain Picard moment. This next one is from Iron Stevie. There are many parts of my youth that I'm not proud of. There were loose threads, untidy parts of me that I would like to remove. But when I pulled on one of those threads, it unraveled the tapestry of my life. Another great Picard quote and great Picard moment from a great Picard-themed episode, Tapestry, one of my very, very, very favorite TNG episodes that they ever did. I love Tapestry. And yeah, it's a great a great button to put on that episode when he's telling that to Riker at the end, when he's, he's, he's learned the lesson that perhaps Q was intending to teach him. You know, you want to go back and change who you were back then. But if you did that, who knows, it might fundamentally alter your life and the person you are now. And would it be worth all of that? That's a question that I think we would all have to ask in that situation. Uh, again, good lesson and also a great bit of character development. So it's nice when those two things happen at the same time. Here's one from Carlisle the Cinephile. Honestly, my favorite Picard scene is probably the scene in Family, where Picard and his brother Robert get into the fight in that mud puddle, break out laughing, and then Picard breaks down and admits how much his experiences as Locutus traumatized him. In a lot of ways, it does the best job of any scene of humanizing Picard. Until this point in the show, we never really see behind the stoic, taciturn, and professional persona he presents while on board the Enterprise. While on duty, he always seems level-headed and cool under pressure, even under the most trying of circumstances. Until this point, Picard seemed like the character that you could look up to and aspire to be, not a character you could really relate to. This scene did a lot to remedy that. What he does in family, in that scene with Robert, where he breaks down and, and, you know, and he's crying and he says, you know, I should have been strong enough to stop them. Why wasn't I strong enough to stop them? Um, that makes him more admirable because he's able to admit that he's having problems dealing with this. You know, he's been denying it all through the episode. In that first scene between uh, Picard and Troy on the Enterprise as he's about to leave, Troy is like, you sure you're okay? And he's like, I'm fit as a fiddle, you know? I don't have the bad dreams anymore, and I've physically recovered, and I'm fine. I'm just fine, you know? And by the end of that episode, we have seen Without the episode drawing it out or teasing it all that much, like we don't, it's not like we see his hand shaking or we see little snippets of, oh, he's really more traumatized than he's letting on. It just pours out of him in that scene with Robert. And yeah, it, it's, it, to me, it makes, him, it makes him more admirable because as you say, it, he is more relatable. As Robert says in that, in that scene, my brother is a human being, you know? 
And, and we relate to human beings. We, we don't relate to, to statues. We don't relate to, to perfect, unblemished heroes who always know what to do and, and always have their wits about them in any situation. We relate to human characters. And that scene in that episode in general really makes Picard more of a human character uh, than he has been up to that point in the show. So I, I totally agree with you. That's a, it's a wonderful episode and a wonderful moment um, for Picard. I love that scene. I love pretty much everything with Robert Picard in that episode. <laughs> Here's one from Sean Hillman. I think my two favorite Picard moments are in Measure of a Man, when during the trial he tells Data that he doesn't think Tasha would have minded. He is more than a captain, more than a defense counsel. He is Data's friend, who probably understands more than he lets on. The second one is Darmok, when Picard is telling the story of Gilgamesh as the other captain lay dying. Again, Darmok, great episode. Picard telling the story of Gilgamesh to Captain Dathan in the sort of idiom, in the sort of diction of... The Tamarians uh, telling it in very breaking it down into its basic elements and telling it in simple declarative sentences. There's something so beautiful and so well done about that whole scene. And yeah, Picard and Data in Measure of a Man. Obviously, it's 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 a very very important touchstone for the Picard series that we're seeing now on CBS All Access. And uh, I think not just in terms of the plot, although it seems like it's going to be real, it's already important and it's going to be really important for the plot of, of that series. But yeah, also important for bringing into focus the relationship of Picard and Data. Because, you know, I've, I've heard the complaint from some people who have said, well, since when were Picard and Data so close? Because it's a very important part of the premise of the Picard series that Picard has been... Uh, grieving the death of Data since the events of Star Trek Nemesis. Like, he's he's been haunted by Data's death. And some people have said, um, you know, well, since when were Picard and Data such good friends? As though, you know, Data and Geordi were the only, like, Geordi was the only friend close enough to Data that who had the right to mourn him, as though it's it would be completely out of character for Picard, a human being who served on a ship with Data for a very, very long time and shared many, many adventures with him and got into many life and death scrapes with him and also was one of his closest friends and tutors, as it were, in Data's quest to better understand humanity and, and become more like a human himself as though it would be completely out of character for Picard to miss Data that much. And I just, I've, I, I don't feel that way, and I don't think it's that much of a stretch for Picard to show that depth of feeling for Data now that Data is gone, and now that Picard himself is growing old and nearing the end of his life. Um, I think it's completely reasonable and completely within character for him to feel that way. And uh, that the, the little moments throughout the series, like in Measure of a Man, when, when it's clear that Picard and Data are maybe not blood brothers, maybe not best friends, but are much closer to one another than captain and uh, subordinate officer. You know? Uh, yeah, little moments like that when he softly says to Data, as it's sotto voce, as though it's just a, something private between the two of them during the hearing when he says, I, under the circumstances, I don't think Tasha would mind. It's a very nice moment that establishes a relationship there that you can imagine meaning a great deal to both of them. Next question is from Yarek Carey. I would enjoy a series exploring Picard's 20-year command of the Stargazer. A young Picard commanding an underpowered bucket of bolts? The potential is endless. Picard's command of the Stargazer is such a blank slate. It's such a... a it's First of all, it's 20 years, so the show could run forever. I mean, I, I, there's never been a Star Trek TV series that's run anywhere close to 20 years, so they would have a lot of area to play in if they decided to do the show for a long time. And there's very little about that period in Picard's life that has ever been established on screen. So yeah, there's so much potential there to play with. And the premise of a young Captain Picard, so you can, you can show us glimpses of the Picard that we know of the man that he will become, but at the same time you also have the freedom to write him as, as more or less a new character. And yeah, the, the romantic idea of he's, he's a young captain, he's been placed in command of this, um, of this old, falling apart starship off on this epic mission where he'll be exploring the galaxy for the next 20 years with, you know, uh, it, it's a really, really cool 
idea and it has a lot of potential assuming that they would that it would be a well-written show and that they would be able to cast it well enough so they could give us a young picard that would be capable of at least somewhat filling the shoes of patrick stewart who we know is as older picard so i I don't know. I, I, I think it's it's a, a good enough idea that I would be willing to take a shot with it because, yeah, that is, it is such a, a blank canvas in already established Star Trek lore that you could explore with a show like that. That, that could be a pretty cool show. Here's one from Dataport Doll. Did we really get through this whole video without a naked Picard throwback joke? All right, there you go. Yeah, I mean, you said throwback, so I, I mean, yeah, I, I was trying, I'm trying to retire that bit. So, you know, that's why I didn't use it, because it's I'm, the bit's retired. But since you asked, by popular demand, for you, that important doll, there's your naked Picard. Enjoy. Here's one from Johann Sigel Reithmeyer. I would take a bet that Spock had a closer relationship to the Enterprise than Scotty or Kirk. Have you ever counted how many years Spock was living on that ship and in the same quarters? I know I lose sight of that myself sometimes, and I, I think a lot of us do, but Spock, yeah, he, he served on the Enterprise, on the NCC 1701, for God, for a hell of a long time. He was there under, under Pike, and then he was there under Kirk, and, uh, you know, and, and also... You know, in that short trek from uh, last year where they, it's the one where it ends up being mostly number one and Spock stuck in the turbo lift. Um, that's showing us a really historic Star Trek moment because that begins with Spock coming aboard the Enterprise to begin his tour of duty on the Enterprise that will last for, you know, got over 20 years. Um, that's a really cool historic Star Trek moment that I, it didn't really dawn on me how important that was until... I read your question because I liked that short trick. I thought that was a really cool episode and I loved the interaction between Spock and uh, number one. But yeah, that's, that's Spock coming aboard the Enterprise for the first time, which we never saw before. And that's a big moment. And yeah, uh, Spock was the, the longest, I think, of, of all the, the characters that were ever established, um, the longest continuously serving officer on the Enterprise NCC-1701, or second longest serving, depending on what you consider the canonical status of the Ensign's Log to be. Here's one more from the Captain Picard video from Larry Moody. Love this guy. Always insightful and sharp. I agree, Larry. Captain Picard is always insightful and sharp. Very perceptive comment. These next few are comments on my video uh, about why Enterprise had the worst finale ever. There's one from kbrock9146. Scott Bakula got screwed twice in series finales, Enterprise and Quantum Leap. Two series that could have had it all, but instead fell completely apart on the last episode. Yeah, I'm not as hard on the last episode of Quantum Leap as most people are. Like, I still wouldn't say it's one of the show's best episodes. But I don't think it's as awful as a lot of people say it is. But in general, yes, I, I agree with your comment. Although Scott Bakula is having the last laugh because uh, he is currently in, what, season five or six of, of NCIS New Orleans, which is a procedural on CBS. So, you know, it's probably going to run 10 or 11 or 15 seasons, even though no one I know has ever watched it. Here's one from Patrick Dodds. I don't know, as flawed and weird as These Are the Voyages is, I've been able to watch it many times and enjoy it for its weirdness. On the other hand, I've only been able to sit through Voyager's Endgame once. Endgame is such a pathetically formulaic, forgettable episode with a dramatic cheat at the end. It makes These Are the Voyages look like City on the Edge of Forever. Then again, I love TNG, and maybe that's the reason I've watched it many times. I will give These Are the Voyages this. Uh, unlike Endgame, which I agree is a bad episode, I'm not, you know, but unlike Endgame, These Are the Voyages is only an hour long. So its many, many shortcomings and offenses are at least somewhat ameliorated by its relative brevity. Did that sound sophisticated? Did that sound like something that like a critic or, a, you know, a media analyst would say? That's what I was going for with that. 
Here's one from Light Blue Phoenix. I really wish we could have heard Archer's speech. That would have improved the episode and maybe even helped motivate Riker instead of the whole trip thing. Though I was happy to see Shran again, it was the highlight of the episode. He was one of the best secondary characters in that show. I agree with you about Shran. I, th I thought he was a terrific uh, recurring character on Enterprise as well. And you gotta love anytime you see Jeffrey Combs. Um, I don't know. I'm not really all that bothered by the fact that we didn't see Archer's speech. I mean, after it was built up as much as it was... Is anything they could have shown us, would anything they could have shown us as far as that speech lived up to the legend? You know, you're basically asking the writers of the show, hey, write a historic, write, basically write another Gettysburg Address. Go. You know, I don't know. Maybe they could have come up with something, but I don't, I don't really have a problem with not seeing the speech. I didn't really expect to see the speech. Like, even when I was watching the episode to begin with, I I never really thought, oh, and it's going to end with him giving the speech. I just didn't seem like, that didn't seem where they were going. So that never really bothered me. There's a lot of stuff about that episode that bothers me, obviously, as you know from the video, but not seeing Archer's speech, that, that that's never been something that I really got hung up on. Sam Ferguson, why did Troy have to memorize Archer's speech when even he didn't have to memorize it? Also, I think Enterprise could have been a hit if they had written it just prior to and during the Romulan War. You know, this is another thing, like, like the last comment where they said, uh, we never got to see Archer's speech and not hurt the episode. That's a very common complaint that I hear a lot of fans saying. And I've seen a lot of other people make a similar comment about, well, Enterprise should have dramatized the Romulan War, or if Enterprise had had more to do with the Romulan War, or if they did another... If they did another season or two of Enterprise, oh, I really wish they would have done the Romulan War. And again, like, I could not care less about the Romulan War. Like, it didn't break my heart at all that Enterprise never really dramatized the Romulan War. They did some stuff sort of, you know, having to do with the lead up to it and the, like the drone ship and all of that stuff. It's eh, whatever. I mean, it was it was it was okay. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't great. But I mean, I, I'm I've just I've never been like dying to see the Earth Romulan War depicted on the screen. It's just never been something that I've been all that interested in. If some writer or producer came up with a great story for a show that was set during the Earth Romulan War, then absolutely I'm there for it. But just the general idea of, ooh, the Earth Romulan War, it doesn't really do it for me. Now these next few comments are about my video where I proposed a rewrite of Enterprise's finale. This first one is from Kevin Thomas. I love how your episode was about the people and not some lame gimmick. Thanks, Kevin. I, I like that rather about my story, too. <laughs> I, I, I prefer stories about, about uh, characters rather than lame gimmicks. It's, it's a shame that the, the authors of that final episode of Enterprise <laughs> didn't feel the same way. This next one is from Jeremy Schneider. Somewhere in your ending, we need Shran or Jeffrey Combs as chef. A couple people left comments like this, and as soon as I saw them, I, uh, I was immediately regretful and ashamed that I didn't think of it first. If we were going to show Chef on screen, and I'm not saying necessarily that, that we should have seen Chef. I kind of like the idea of never paying that off, of just leaving Chef unseen. But if we were going to show Chef on camera, uh, having Jeffrey Combs play him would be fantastic. Dre Kunguis, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, probably not. Since you have Archer commanding the NX project for the final shot, it should be Archer back on Earth in his office and a member of his staff showing him blueprints for the suggested improvements to the NX class, the Drexler NX refit that has the secondary hull. See, this seems a little too nerdy to me. I know this would be like a nice fan service moment for a lot of us Star Trek nerds to show like, ooh, and now they're going to refit it so it'll start to look more like the, the classic Trek Enterprise. But that's this isn't a very dramatic ending. Like, ending the series... On, on Archer, like, in his office, looking at blueprints? That's not very dramatic to me. Ending ending the series where, where I had it ending in my pitch, where it, the, the last shot is the doors of the turbo lift closing on Archer as the new captain takes her seat in the captain's chair, like the passing of the torch, the changing of the guard, and that moment of, you know, Archer leaving the bridge as captain for the last time. Like, that to me is drama. That, to me, is ending the show on a really strong, dramatic image. Uh, Archer looking at blueprints. Even if it's blueprints for like, ooh, look, they're going to refit it, so it's going to look more like the classic Enterprise. Like, 
it's not dramatic to me. Here's one from Pegasus the Wise. The only thing I would change is to have Hoshi get recruited by the diplomatic corps and work with the delegates to negotiate the original Federation charter. I also kind of like the residents of Archer and Trip returning to Earth to head up the NX program and to Paul being asked to return to High Command but choosing to go with Trip instead. A kind of inverse of Amanda and Sarek later, but I'm not married to it. I think those are all really good ideas, actually. I think those are all at least as good as the ideas I had. I mean, my main goal in terms of moving the characters around at the end and getting them promoted and assigned to different ships was I really, really wanted with my pitch to show that life goes on and that there these characters are not going to be frozen in amber like the TNG crew was during the movies. You know, like these these characters, these these crew members of the NX Enterprise are heroes. They are historical, legendary heroes in 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 the the pantheon of of Earth history and Starfleet history, and they deserve to be rewarded and recognized for that. So when they come back home to Earth and it's time for their mission to end, um, you know they do get promoted, and maybe they do jump a few ranks in the promotions, and maybe they do get assigned to different ships that you might think you know well and w would an ensign really get that kind of an assignment straight from from ensign to first officer or whatever. Um, they're heroes. They've saved the galaxy. They've saved the world multiple times. Their experience warrants these promotions because they have they have served on the Enterprise for all these years and they they are more than up to the task of doing whatever the new assignment is. So that was my main point of rewarding them for their heroism and showing that they that their lives go on after their time aboard Enterprise. So that was the direction I went with it. But I really like your suggestions as well. I, I like the idea of Hoshi moving on to the diplomatic corps. And I like the idea of Archer and Trip and uh, T'Pol being together to oversee the NX program. I don't see why that wouldn't work if we presented it in the right way. This next one is from Trendane Sparks. This may have been mentioned elsewhere in the comments, and if so, my apologies for the repetition. I was thinking that you should at some point reference how Archer is getting back to Earth for his new job, even if it's just a passing reference to a transport vessel. If the Enterprise is to take him back, then Captain Fletcher's last line should be some playful comment to Travis about getting the Admiral home so we can get on with business. And if the Columbia was to take him back to Earth, it would likely make more sense for the Columbia just to return to Earth herself for transfer of personnel. Then she and Enterprise can strike out on their missions from Earth at the same time. Just some slight shifting to avoid the idea of Archer still being aboard when the Enterprise heads out. Also, Archer and Fletcher, nice connection in that. Well, that I can't take credit for that because Fletcher is a name that was already existing. Fletcher was a name that was established, I think, in one of the novels as, uh, as, a, as the first officer on uh, the Columbia. So I chose that name and that character to succeed Archer. Um, but yeah, I, I, it, it is a nice, a nice connection there, isn't it? And um, yeah, I, I, I fumbled and, and, and wrestled with that, that last scene with Archer a little bit. Originally, I did have him uh, leaving Enterprise to go aboard Columbia. Um, and I guess that would still work. I guess we, we could sort of reconfigure that last scene as I presented it so that the ships um, have not yet uh, have not yet undocked. So maybe the last piece of business one, once Archer leaves is that the ships separate. And so we could have as, as Captain Fletcher takes her seat and banters with, uh, with Travis, you know, their, their lines could be about, you know, as soon as we disengage from Columbia, we'll get underway or something like that. So the implication is that as Archer is leaving the bridge and we see the doors closing, that he is on his way to Columbia to leave aboard that ship. And yeah, I, I agree with you. I do think we, we need to establish where Archer is going next. And, and it would be preferable if he were not to remain aboard Enterprise. It would be more poignant if he were leaving the ship and more appropriate to that being an ending if he were not only giving up command but was also leaving the ship. So yeah, I agree with you that that needs to be figured out. And having him go to the Columbia uh, would be a good, a good way of doing that. Here's one from CJ442. I would have still ended it with the Space the Final Frontier montage with Archer, Kirk, and Picard. Maybe have Captain Kelly start it off? I really like that, especially since it was, at the time, as far as anyone knew, the last Star Trek TV series. I don't know about that. 
I mean, I obviously, I, I get why it's appealing because it was the last series as far as anyone knew. I mean, I, I understand, but, but for me personally, I don't know if that's the way I would want to do it for a couple reasons. First, if we did my story or some version of my pitch, uh, I don't know if having the voices of the different captains pitch in on the Space the Final Frontier narration would make as much sense as it did in These Are the Voyages because of the presence of Riker and the connection in that episode to another series as as bad of an idea as I think that was. Um, and a, a couple people said that it, it could have ended with just Archer himself doing the space, the final frontier narration. And I'm not really I'm not really in favor of that either because we've just seen that so many times. Like I feel like that is that that's a that's too familiar of a beat. And a lot of the suggestion, a lot of the suggestions that people made uh, to sort of change or augment my story were really, really good. But a lot of them were just ways of people saying, well, you should do this because it's more like some other thing that Star Trek did. It was trying to make it more familiar. And I don't really like to do that. Like, I would want to, to make something that was true to the series that it was ending, but that didn't just do a bunch of stuff that Star Trek had already done. So having Archer do the Space the Final Frontier, like, you know, I get it. It makes sense, and I'm sure it would, it would be pleasing to a lot of people, but we've heard that. You know, like, we haven't heard Archer do it, okay, but we've heard that. Kirk's done it, Picard's done it, Spock's done it a bunch of times. Like, we've, we've been there, we've done that, we've, we've, you know, we've trampled that ground. Let's do something else. And, you know, I, I think the, my idea of ending on Archer and the doors closing and, and maybe, and then beyond that, if you want to have a shot after that of, of Enterprise going to warp and, and leaving Archer wherever he is or going off on its mission with someone else in command. That to me is, a, and I, granted, that's not all that original of an image either, because we've seen Enterprise go to warp a million times. So that in and of itself isn't an original image, but in the context of warping off to its next mission under the new captain, that I feel has enough weight that that would function as a good, a, a fitting final image. Um, and, you know, having, having the, the space, the final frontier narration again, you know, I just, I don't, I personally don't really see the appeal to that. That feels like something that has been done to death and we don't really need anymore. And finally, this comment from Jesse Willie. What happens to Porthos? Does he get a promotion? Well, Porthos goes to live on a farm on Alpha Centauri. It's a beautiful farm. And there's lots of other dogs there for him to play with. And, you know, when dogs get to be Porthos's age and they get a little older and they don't get around as well as they used to, they like to go someplace with lots of open spaces where they can run around outside. And, you know, the gravity on Alpha Centauri B is, uh, is, is a, little, it's a little lighter than it is here on Earth. So, they, you know, they send him to the colony on Alpha Centauri and, and he can run around and play just like a puppy again with all the other dogs that are there. And, and he'll get to live forever. He'll live forever on that farm in Alpha Centauri. And, you know, they drop him off there on their way out uh, from, from the Terran system. And that's what happens to Porthos. He just lives on that Alpha Centaurian farm forever and ever and ever. I really am going to end the video on a dead dog joke. I just, I want to make that clear. I'm totally going to do that. You know, I, but it does, you bring up a good point. I did, I did forget to, to reckon with Porthos. So if, if my pitch were to be made into a proper episode, we would have to figure out something for Porthos. And I would not, I, I would not actually want to kill off Porthos or to, to, to show him going off to the farm in the next solar system, as it were, in any sense. I would want to give Porthos a nice happy ending because he's a good dog and he deserves a happy ending, but I don't know what that would be. But you're right to point out that I did not really come up with an ending for Porthos. So that would have to happen before the episode could really come to life and actually get made. Um, and also we'd have to invent a time machine because they ended Enterprise 15 years ago and the episode is just never going to exist. So I guess I didn't end on the dead dog joke after all because I kept talking. So good job, me. See, I, got my, I wrote myself out of it.
I didn't write my, I blathered my way out of it. So either way, mission accomplished. So anyway, that's it, everybody. Thank you all so much for the comments. Thank you all for watching this long, pointless video. Um, I will be back in a few weeks uh, to do the next Regulation Trek Actually video, which we already talked about in responses to earlier comments. It will be on the subject of why do conservatives actually like Star Trek? That'll be uh, hopefully a fun and interesting video to do. And, uh, and I don't, I, that'll probably be the next Star Trek themed video that I do. So, you know, stay tuned to the channel for other non-Trek related videos, if, if you would be so kind. And if you do or if you don't, either way, I'll see you in the next Trek Actually video. So thank you for watching this time. I'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.